Hey everyone, and welcome back to Death and All of His Friends. This study session is devoted to watching the unfolding narrative of sin, particularly here in Genesis chapter 3, as we mosey on toward chapter 5. This section that we're going to read today, it's, it's challenging. This is God's kind of formal response to sin. We've watched God respond and kind of looking at the bookend of this section, God's questioning, where are you? Inviting them into confession, inviting them into the light inviting them out of hiding, and at the end of this section, clothing them, uh, restoring their dignity, even at the cost of sacrifices. It's made out of skin. But today, we look at this formal, poetic structure, God speaking to each party involved in the trauma of sin. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 through 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Whew. Okay, so these are the curses. These are the divine edicts. God's, what is he going to do? God has to deal with it now. He has to confront sin. Sin is the fracturing of his, of his good, good creation. It is the seeking of moral autonomy from, from humans. How is he going to respond to this? I really want to attend to is two things in this study session. is One, the redemptive element of his curses. The logical corollary to living in sin are these things. To the serpent, this this whole eat dust thing, like obviously God isn't saying they're going to eat dust, you know, looking at some commentaries on that. Nobody in the ancient world thought that snakes ate dust. This is an idiom for humiliation, uh, as, as Victor Hel Hamilton, one commentator, puts it. It's an idiom of humiliation. Eat dust. You, you will be humiliated. You will be put down. It's interesting that he addresses the serpent first and... Yeah, there's some symmetry here to this section and, and a previous section. The serpent isn't off the hook, right? Like sin, uh, like we've been saying all along, we started this exploration by looking at the serpent, this this cunning deceiver, and noting its role in sin. And, and, and here God calls all three parties to account. It's Sin is not just something that humanity caused in and of itself. They were helped, they were aided, and, and that party is addressed. And so we, we can't... Uh, pretend that God is ignoring the the enemy here. He actually is addressing him. And it's really fascinating. There's a lot of ink spilled on this, but we're, 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 we're perhaps looking at the first messianic hope. Uh, by that, we, we mean that somebody is coming to save them. And it's this seed, this descendant, um, this offspring of Eve. So someone who is in a, in hu in a part of the human family tree who is going to, to crush the serpent's head and it's the same verb but 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 it's related to the heel for the 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 snake so you're not exactly sure what's going on but so sometimes you'll see, see translations say a strike the head and and the snake will strike the heel to strike the head of something is its defeat its demise and so already here in the garden we have an understanding that that god is somehow going to partner with humanity and here again is is the the hint of a promise the fact that Eve is going to have descendants mean that she's going to live to have kids. 
and you know we don't know how long this descendant we're going to be waiting for, but we know that family tree is a big family tree. So do you hear the hint of promise? God is continuing humanity, and he's going to partner with it, and he's going to use one of Eve's children to, to crush the head of the serpent, to execute a final judgment. And so here, perhaps, before we even left the garden, we have a shred of hope that one day a son of Eve will defeat the serpent. Is anybody hitting any, any uh, Jesus alarm bells? Yeah, we think you're meant to. <laughs> so hold on to that. That serpent's going down. It's not going to survive the head, but the, the victor is going to be wounded. And, and this is a, a motif that gets developed later on. And, and you see some of this uh, shades in the prophets, say like Isaiah 53, where you have someone who's, who becomes a sacrificial lamb. And so this, uh, you, you see in, in Revelation, the, the wounded victor, the, the ultimate, uh, you know, messianic final appearance of Jesus as reigning king. He comes even with blood of his own on his own robes. And so the, the idea that sin is going to cost this figure dearly is already built in to this curse of the serpent. The curse is a salvific promise. By and large, this curse idea is a frustration of of existence. Uh, let me let me kind of clarify that a little bit. Uh, we know the serpent's going down, but uh, but how are Eve and how are Adam frustrated? Her pain of childbirth will greatly increase. And so you hear the promise there. You hear the curse there, of course. <laughs> and anybody who's ever had kids or talked to anybody that's ever had kids, you know that the greatly increased child pains is a, is a big deal and, and even more so a big deal before the advent of medical care like we have today. The, the unique role that, the, 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 that only females play in, in the family system, the birthing of children, it's now frustrated. It now has pain. You hear this frustration of the earth. And, and so it, it, it's with great toil that they're going to be able to produce food. But ah, do you hear the promise in either of those things? This is a birth announcement. And it's also an announcement of provision. Built into the curse is the hope of continuance, the continuing grace of God that the humanity made in the image of God, the human project is going to continue. God is going to sustain it. Maybe this will help Victor Hamilton, his commentary on, on Genesis. He says, to each of the trespassers, God speaks a word which involves a life function, right, with childbearing and with, with producing food, and a relationship. I think it may be helpful here to to kind of soak in this a little bit. So we're let's stay with Adam and Eve for a minute. We'll go with Victor Hamilton once again. The sinful husband will try to be a tyrant over his wife, far from being a reign of co-equals as God designed it in Genesis 1. Let's hold on to God's design. Over the remainder of God's creation, the relationship will become a fierce dispute with each party trying to rule the other. The two who once reigned as one attempt to rule each other. So guys, this is the frustration of relationship. This is the natural consequence of sin. We actually already saw this. I'm inclined to think that God is, is less speaking this into existence than making an observation. Remember, when God had already confronted Adam and Eve, Adam threw Eve under the bus and Eve wanted to blame the serpent. And you already see this self-preservation creep in, that this is, this is part of sin, uh, this self-interest, the desire to put oneself above another. And what, might I add that while we're fixating here on a marital relationship, because this is the first couple, that we can, we can scale this up. This isn't just, you know, uh, some, something that plays out within the confines of a, of a marriage or a covenant relationship. This kind of battling with one another, this dispute, this lack of partnership, this attempt to dominate one another, this characterizes the whole human family, as we'll see unfold with their children and their children and their children. And as we have watched throughout the waves of history in our own lives, humans want to dominate one another. We could talk about it in terms of different individual relationships. We could talk about it in family systems. We could talk about it in tribes or in countries or on a bigger scale. 
but humans want to dominate one another. This isn't just something that plays out in the marriage relationship. So don't get too, too myopic on this while this is playing out in Adam and Eve's relationship. This is characterizing humanity as a whole. It's here I find it helpful to take a look at the 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 big the bigness of this problem. Maybe this whole curse of the earth thing seems big and weird. Maybe if you're like me, a fan of the Lord of the Rings, it's not too hard to imagine. Tolkien really describes it quite well in his in, in the Frodo and Sam's experience of Mordor. So let me pick up on that observation. Mordor was a dying land, but it was not itself dead. And here things still grew, harsh, twisted, bitter, struggling for life. What I love about Tolkien is that he characterizes his landscape as marred by the evil that was there. And that's the kind of impression we need to have so many things wrong that we can complain about, not just relationships, but the fabric of existence. It's touched by sin, too. We we have some fantastic... uh, theological framework from the authors of this book uh when helping hurts see this little thing here i'm gonna adapt this real quick so let's just take a look at the relational fabric that is torn by sin god's reality his his creation is a relational framework there's a relationship between the person and god the person and creation the person and other persons humanity and persons and the self we're interrelational beings just as god father spirit son is an interrelational being in and of himself and adam and eve the uh, were invited to represent that interrelational reality as co-equals sin turns the human in towards self-preservation, towards self-interest, toward wanting to rule over one another. When we are our own gods, other people are less than. And that happens in a relational framework in subtle and and twisted ways that that are just so normative to, to human relationships and hierarchies and all of this and struggling and jostling to be on top. That's what God is saying. This is going to happen in your even your most intimate of relationships are not safeguarded from this. And so when we think about the effects of sin on the fabric of relationships as a whole, as the cosmic fabric of relationships, we know that there's going to be a frustrated relationship between God and person, a frustrated relationship between God and creation. as The person and, the, and humanity are going to have a hard time. And even the person and the self are going to be estranged from, from one another. I do want to add on this section with Eve in particular, before we move on, is this word for desire. We're going to actually take a a greater look at this word because it's not a positive word. It's not like, oh, romantic desire. Uh, What's so bad about this? Uh, You know, this, this is a desire to dominate. We're going to, it's the same word uh, used in, in chapter four, verse 17, I believe of the relationship that Cain has with his own sin, that sin wants to, it desires him, it <laughs> desires to devour him. And so so we, we see that something in in the, re, the relational framework of humanity, ah, we want to consume, devour, dominate, rule over one another in ways that we hardly understand that this is sinful nature now. You're, let me try to condense this a little bit. Sin pollutes the relational environment of reality. There's danger in the relational environment of humanity because of sin. You can think of this as, as relational vandalism, that that's what sin is. It's, it's this, it wreaks havoc on the relational fra- fabric of, of the cosmos and God's good creation. And so we're not surprised to see this play out in the most intimate of relationships here in this curse section. But, but as we'll see throughout the biblical narrative, and as we know from experience in human history, and as we understand from church tradition, this touches every human relationship. Sin does. Romans is such a rich passage. Paul developed in this this. this kind of big picture summary of theology for the sake of the the Romans who he hopes to go to in person and he's writing this letter and, and it's just poignant section here and so chapter 8 verse 20 and, and part of a larger argument for the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice but by the will of the one who subjected it and hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole 
creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. We're invited to see the conflation, the combining, the the, the layers of Adam and Eve's curse section here in Genesis chapter 3 as Paul sees this abstractly in some sense and concretely in others play out in the whole of the cosmos. What do I mean by this? The pain of childbirth and the pain of the earth, they're related. They're related. These curses are related. They're the productive pains. If, if, again, if, if you ever talked to anybody who's had children, you've had children of your own, you know that, that, that it's a painful process, but it's, it's so worth it. It's productive pain. It leads to something new. It is the birthing of something new. And, and somehow God is using our frustrated sinful nature, the one that became in turn self-preservation, relational fractures, all of the stuff we've been talking about. And God is going to somehow invite us through that experience uh, of, of, of being painfully aware of our own sinful nature. He is going to invite us into the birth of something new. And what is he waiting for? This The, the glory of the children of God. So all over Genesis chapter 3 in this curse section and this, this diagnosis of relational vandalism and how God is going to deal with it, we hear overtones of a birth announcement that there's going to be this figure, there's going to be this birth, there's going to be this person who's going to defeat this serpent, there's going to be this hope in the continuance of humanity and the creation itself is waiting for the children of God to be revealed and this is our hope that that I hope you hear that even here in Genesis chapter three, the, the most uh, one of the more challenging un- uh, sections of I'm trying to understand what is what is God up to here? He is he is seeding the the narrative of our redemption there in the midst of our lowest moment and of our initial rebellion. So hear this that 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 there is something about this relational state that we've been lamenting that God is going to use to mend us. He's he's not going to say, you know what, these broken pieces that you've made of yourself, I'm going to chuck them. No. He's going to say, we're going to put you back together. It's going to be painful. But we're going to put you back together. relationships that were vandalized, that were torn apart, that were ripped, that were severed. Through Christ, they're mended. Let's read in Colossians. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, this is Christ, and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We've talked about this all along, that there's something costly about the repair for sin. And God bore that on his own son. The big view of sin, it's painful to think about how much of life, how every relationship, every one of them, even the best and most fulfilling relationships we can have, are tinged, fraught, threatened by sin. That as we desire to rule over one another, all of these things find meaning, wholeness, productive pain, if you will, understanding that Jesus is coming to mend this and in fact is mending it as we speak. The deeper we go in our doctrine of sin, the greater appreciation we have of our doctrine of sanctification, of what Christ comes to do to fix it.